And today we've got Dr. Laura Andre with us. And um, as part of International Women's Day celebrations and for the month of March, we'll be celebrating and exploring the journeys of talented female scientists, educators, support staff and professional service members that contribute to our world leading research centers, the Center for Developmental Neurobiology and the MRC Center for Neurodevelopmental Disorders within King's College London. So it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Laura. Um, my first question to you is uh, what has been your journey to your current position? Okay, so my journey, I guess, um, has been maybe a little bit longer in that I started out as a clinician. So um, I read medicine at university um, and, uh, you know, went through to, to clinical school, did my house jobs, did all my internships, um, and even got as far as um, MRCP and a, a year as a specialist registrar. So kind of quite a long way down the whole kind of clinical practice route. Um, and then I got one of these um, fellowships for medics to do a PhD. Uh, and, and I'd always in the back of my mind kind of had this thought that I really love um, doing you know, research in particular. And, um, and I wanted to kind of go back to some of the basic science that I'd done as an undergrad. And so I, I decided to do a PhD in developmental neuroscience. And basically halfway through my PhD, I decided that I wanted to stay in research. And, um, and so following the end of my PhD, I went on to do um, uh, two postdocs uh, before starting my job as a lecturer. Mm, wonderful. So um, leading on nicely, can you tell us about your current position um, at King's and within the centre? Sure. So uh, I'm a senior lecturer in the Centre for Developmental Neurobiology, and um, I, run a, I run a small but wonderful lab, um, and we work on basically on synapse formation. So um, what are the rules that drive uh, synapses to form at the right time in the right place, um, and how does that pr process go awry in disorders of brain development? So I have a particular interest in autism, but actually a lot of the genes that we know implicated in these disorders um, kind of overlap with a variety of uh, other conditions such as schizophrenia, infant disability, epilepsy, etc. So, uh, so that's the main focus of the lab. Uh, plus, of course, I do lots of teaching to the uh, undergraduates, postgraduates, master students, um, and across many different courses, which is actually wonderful as well, really interesting and challenging and, you know, always makes you think. So a sort of combination of, of the two. Yeah, so you've got, um, it seems like you have a lot of variety uh, in your job. And of course, also being a coordinator for a wonderful PhD program. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, what do you like most about your current job? So I think what I like most is the fact that uh, you never stop learning. So, um, you know, pretty much every day I learn something new. In fact, definitely every day I learn something new. And uh, it's always challenging. You're always having to, whether it's do things like problem solve, so you're trying to you know, work out why an experiment isn't working and you're sort of you know, fiddling about, um, or you're trying to plan a, you know, a grant proposal and think of ideas of what would be cool experiments to do. And then inevitably science leads you in unexpected ways down surprising paths. And so then you find yourself having to learn about some completely new topic, which is always exciting and fun. Um, and then just, you know, it, we do a lot of reviewing of, of grants and papers, and that always ends up, you always end up having to learn new stuff and read up about a few topics as well. So I think that sort of sense where, you know, every day is, is different and you're always, always being challenged to learn something new is what, is what I love most. I will say that the second thing I love most are my uh, colleagues and the students, because I think that, um, you know, I'm just, really lucky to be surrounded by you know curious brilliant fun people um sort of like-minded geeky types who get really excited about science so i think that's another thing that i really value yes and um it seems as though like we work in a very very collaborative uh, um, environment so it's really nice um so now a bit of a, a trickier question uh, what is the most challenging thing about either um, the journey you've taken to your current um, job or, your, or, or also within your current role? Okay, so maybe I'll sort of, um, I guess there are two things that immediately come to mind. I think the most challenging thing about my role as a, as a group leader or principal investigator 
is um, the fact that it involves a lot of projection. So um, and I think this probably resonates for everyone actually in whatever walk of life you are. But um, uh, you know, I think most people agree that in academia, you know, there's with submitting papers and grants, you know, that you, you get you get a lot of rejection and you get a lot of you know, there's a little bit of opportunity for kind of you know the anonymous peer review can sometimes people don't show their best aspects of their personality sometimes. So you know you basically have to be pretty resilient. And um, and I think when it first uh, when I first you know started as a as a group leader, uh, it, it did hit me. It was a surprise. It, you know it was not it's not an experience that I'd had as a as a medic or and obviously not, you know you don't really have it as a student um, or a postdoc. I mean you apply for jobs, but it's not quite the same thing. But this kind of regular rejection that you get when you're kind of once you're a group leader, you you initially are a bit of a shock. Um, but you know, over time, you just you definitely become tougher. You realise how important resilience is, and um, and it you know it improves. So I think that's probably that's the most challenging bit. Um, I think in terms of my journey, <laughs> and this may be relevant to, to um, some of the things we're discussing in the context of uh, you know uh, Women's Day, is that I don't think it was an easy choice that I made to have four children uh, mm. while trying to pursue an academic career. Um, mm. So that was. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, don't regret it for one second. It's been fantastic, but, you know, not easy to combine, you know, maternity, childcare, et cetera, with a demanding job. Absolutely, yes. So um, that, that makes a lot of sense and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure it's not easy at all. So um, bearing that in mind, what positive actions um, could be taken to increase female representation, um, especially at senior levels in science? Yeah, so that's a million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, I think, um, I think for me, you know, the trouble is, is that the things that would make the biggest difference uh, all cost money, um, which is probably not in great supply forever, but especially not at the moment. Um, there are, uh, I think there are probably a, a couple of things that I think would really help. Um, the first would be better childcare provision. Mm. I mean, for starters, and you know, people talk about this a lot, but the reality is, is that it's really thin on the ground and even where it exists, you know, it's impossible to kind of, you know, get your child into the whatever it is. So, mm. um, so I think that would really help. I think practical, real support for, women when they go on maternity leave, because that's often a time when it, you know, it's a critical time in your career. Um, and if you take six months out at that time, for example, um, it can not only does it slow down your research program, but you know, there are sort of knock-on effects from that that can really, you know, that are hard to pin down, but really hamper your career at, at that sort of critical stage. Mm. And so, and by that, I mean, really practical, like, you know, providing you know support for someone to so that they can continue your research while you're on maternity leave you know and I know that would cost money but it would make a big difference um, so I think that would be something that I would really uh, you know hope for um, and then you know I mean, we were chatting earlier about uh, there was there a number of ideas about how you could do this I mean there, and there are lots of sort of you know there's lots of good things out good suggestions out there um, that may help you know increasing diversity of panels um, you know, unconscious bias training. Um, I'm actually now quite a fan of unconscious bias training, actually, I think, um, if it's done well. Um, Would you tell us uh, what, what, very quickly, what that is, unconscious bias training? So, um, so we all have unconscious biases. Right. And uh, it doesn't matter who you are, uh, the, the, the whole point is they're unconscious, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't realize you have them, um, but you do. And, um, and so the fact that I'm a woman does not mean that I'm not slightly biased against women. Mm for example. Uh, and so there's been a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence now that this is the case. Uh, and in fact, there's a little test you can do um, where you discover just how biased you really are. And that's actually, <laughs> just doing that is, is a bit of a shock mm. because you, of course, we all think we're not, we're not prejudiced, you know, mm. we're wonderful and open-minded and don't have biases, but we do. Mm. Um, and so unconscious bias training is, is basically training to make you aware of your own biases to help you combat them when, for example, you are, you know, uh, selecting which applicants mm -hmm. to give a job to or funding to or that sort of thing. Um, and the, the trouble, of course, with it is that, you know, the devil is in the details. So if it's not done well, it's not very helpful. 
and then people say well this is pointless it doesn't work but I do think if it is done well it can be really useful and I certainly you know it came as a big shock to me that I was biased mm. and um and definitely becoming aware of that and we had really great training um I think it did help certainly everyone in my group to think about that a bit a lot more mm. um so so I think it can be really helpful uh but you know it's bit, it's quite it's quite controversial at the moment mm. things i have to say are very good kings require everyone to do unconscious bias training if you're going to sit mm. on any interview panel which mm. i think is a is a is a good mm. strategy um so just with regards to in in the final um stages so just um with regards to things that can be done as you were mentioning to perhaps um increase female representation um were there any more uh things that you want you thought were some ideas out there that were good that could be implemented? Yeah, so I mean, there are a number of ideas out there at the moment um, along the lines of having um, separate streams for applications, whether that's for a job or for um, uh, for funding. And uh, you know, this is it starts to get a bit controversial, but actually, I, I do think that there is some evidence that this can really help. And that's even in the absence of any kind of quota, which is even more controversial. But so mm. rather than saying, look, you know, you, you must appoint at least, you know, X number of women mm. or underrepresented groups. Um, what it is is saying you, um, we're going to have a separate stream for, say, women, where you have to shortlist or you have to consider this group. And, and what that does is it gets people past some, perhaps that unconscious bias stage mm. um, to the point where, you know, you might give them an interview at least and then you begin to, you know, hopefully you will then assess people on the basis of their potential rather than, you know, the kind of, you know, um, some of these uh, metrics that, mm. that, that can be quite biased in themselves. Mm. So, um, so there's some evidence uh, that that can, that can really help. Um, and I think those are, sort of, those are interesting things that people could try just to see whether they do, right? I mean, yes. if, without a quota, I think there's, there's nothing to be lost and, um, mm. and it might be interesting to, to try it. There's also, there's actually a study in Ireland where they, um, they took the names off the grant applications. Mm. Couldn't tell the, the gender of the applicant. And overnight, that dramatically increased the female representation in terms of awardee, mm. which is quite interesting. Yes. So, you know, there, there's, a, you know, there's, I think there's stuff that's out there that I think we need to explore and yes. consider. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for enlightening us. And um, yeah, it'd be really great if more, if, you know, if a few different, um, if um, some different processes were explored and, and see how effective they may be. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And um, pleasure. yes, and um, uh, yeah, I'll conclude there. Thank you so much.